concerning this uh, Christian act of worship. Uh, if you would, if you'd like to read along, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. We'll be reading verses 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord what also I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, this is the this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the blood, against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So the Lord's Supper is a memorial. Note Paul's account uh, as given by the Lord himself in verses 23 and 25. Uh, we eat the bread in memory of, the, of his body. We drink the cup in memory of his blood. We therefore commemorate the death of Jesus on the cross whose death made, makes the new covenant possible, whose blood was shed for the remission of sins. As the Passover was a memorial uh, commemorating Israel's deliverance from Egypt through the blood of the, of the lambs on the doorpost, so the supper is a memorial <clears throat> of our Lord's death that makes our deliverance from bondage of sin possible. Paul goes on to say that the Lord's Supper is a, pro a proclamation we proclaim our faith in the efficacy of the Lord's death in verse 26. We proclaim that his death was indeed for our sins. We also proclaim our faith in the Lord's return, for it is to be done till he comes. Thus, the Lord's Supper looks forward as well as backward, and we will ever be, and will ever be observed by his disciples who trust in his redemption and anticipate his return. Paul tells us it is to be done with reverence. That is in a worthy manner, verses 27, 29. With respect for the supreme price, Jesus paid for our sins. Do you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning, remembering the sacrifice the Lord Jesus made for us, whose blood was shed for the remission of sins. As we partake of these emblems that represent Christ's body and blood, we are thankful for your wonderful plan of salvation, and thankful we serve a risen Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Oh, Lord, I just thank you that we're able to partake of the cup this morning. I ask that you bless the cup and being emblematic of Christ's blood that he allowed to be shed that we might have salvation. I ask this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, today's scripture, we have Hebrews 2, 9 through 16. But we do see Jesus, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitted that God for whom and through whom everything exists um, should, make the, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am and the children God had, has given me. Since the children of flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he may, might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their feet, fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's de descendants. Good morning. Good morning. Want to welcome everybody this morning. And uh, we want to welcome our guest. Uh, we're blessed to, uh, to have a few guests with us this morning. Uh, most of you know Gary Corty that was baptized uh, a few weeks ago and his daughter Christy Stevens. Uh, well, Gary's dad, Clay Corty, is with us uh, this morning. And uh, Clay's sister, Jeannie. Jeannie and her husband, Larry Kirby. So, Daughter, I mean. Sorry. Yeah, Gary's sister. 
be uh, Christy's aunt. So, welcome. It's also to have Larry and Christine's family here. So, we want to welcome everybody this morning. You know, it's been said that uh, one of our greatest fears, one of man's greatest fears, is the fear of death and dying. And we try to ignore its reality. We run from it. And we pretend that it won't happen to us. And yet every day, we are confronted with its reality. All you have to do is turn on your television set and watch the local news, let alone the world news, of its reality. And the Bible reveals to us that reality as well. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this chapter is, is a chapter on the resurrection of Christ and, and the power of the resurrection. But in the midst of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes in verse 21 and 22 the reality of our immortality. He writes in verse 21, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. And so the Bible points us to that reality that all men will die. In Adam all men die. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, the Hebrew writer said it's appointed for men to die once and then comes the judgment. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon says of, that there's an appointed time for everything under the sun. He says in, in chapter 3 and verse 2, he says there's a time to be born and a time to die. In that same book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 9 and verse 5, he says that the living know that they will die. The living know they will die. And then he goes down into verse 11 of that same chapter 9, and he says, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the warriors, neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability. For time and chance overtake them all. Moreover, a man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Solomon's talking about death and how it's appointed for men to die once and, and our time comes for all of us. You know, it, the psalmist raised the question in Psalm chapter 89 and verse 48. He says, what man can live and not see death? The death rate in this world is still 100%. And I want us to see this morning first that death is an enemy. The Bible tells us that death is an enemy. And when Jesus comes again, the second coming, His second coming, the Bible tells us that the last thing that will be abolished is the enemy death. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26 says that the last enemy that will be abolished, or your translation may say destroyed, is death. The Bible says that death is an enemy. And that enemy can make you so afraid of dying that you never learn to live. That enemy can make you and I so afraid of dying that we never really enjoy living because of death and that enemy. I want to share from Max Licato's book that he wrote back in 1989 of Six Hours on Friday. And I want to share... Uh, about a Japanese soldier. Shohoi Yokoi spent 28 years in a prison. Not a prison of walls, but a prison of fear. 
When the tide began to turn in World War II, Shahoikoi was a Japanese soldier on the island of Guam. Fearing that defeat meant certain cap- capture by American forces, he ran into the jungle and hid in a cave. He later learned that the war was over by reading one of the thousands of leaflets that were dropped into the jungle by American planes. Still, he feared being taken as prisoner, so he remained in his cave. For over a quarter of a century, he came out only at night. He existed on frogs, rats, roaches, and mangoes. It was only when some hunters discovered him that he was convinced that it was safe to leave the jungle. Shocking, we say. How could a man be so blind? Tragic, we sigh. What a waste of life. A pity, we lament, that a human would be so imprisoned by fear that he would cease to live. A life wasted pacing up and down in a self-made cell of fear. It is shocking. It is tragic. It is a pity. It is also very common. The fear of death has filled a thousand prisons. You can't see the walls. You can't see the warden. You can't see the locks. But you can see the prisoners. You can see them as they sit there on their bunks and bemoan their fate. They want to live, but they can't. Because they are doomed to do what they most want to avoid. They will die. And oh, how restrictive is this ball and chain of death. You try to run away from it. You can't. You try to run with it. It's too heavy. You ignore it. And it yanks you into reality. Just yesterday I visited a home that was wearing the black wreath of death. The youngest of three daughters, a recently married 22-year-old, had been killed in a collision between an 18-wheeler and a bus. The eyes that met me at the door were those of prisoners. The family was held hostage by answerless questions. Taken captive by the sadness... They couldn't take a dozen steps without walking into a brick wall of disbelief. And you know, every family will experience this enemy of death and its pain. Many of you have already experienced it. Many of us will experience it again. Because death is an enemy. And death can make you so afraid of dying that you never learn to enjoy living here and now, in this life. That's what the enemy does. And I want us to see second this morning that because of the empty tomb, Jesus conquered death. He conquered this enemy. And I want you to turn your Bibles to the Matthew chapter 27 of Matthew's account when Jesus died on the cross that Friday. In Matthew the 27th chapter... In Matthew's account, in verse 50 of Matthew chapter 27, in verse 50, it says when Jesus died, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up His Spirit. The other gospel accounts tell us that that He committed, He breathed His last and committed His Spirit to God. And Father, into Thy hands I commit my Spirit. And those last words, Jesus breathed His last And he died. In that same account of Matthew chapter 27, go down to verse 62. In verse 62, Matthew writes, Now on the next day, which is the one after preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate. And they said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days, I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, 
He has risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure along with the guard. And they set a seal on the stone. Mark's account tells us in Mark 16 that that stone that was rolled over that tomb was a very large stone. Extremely large stone. And when you read Matthew's account, it just seems like at the end of chapter 27 that they just took one guard and secured the grave. But it's more than one guard. That one guard is over many guards. And so we know in Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 28, just the next chapter, that when uh, Jesus was raised on that Sunday morning, that verse 4 says that the guards shook for fear of Him and became like dead men. There were guards. In verse 11 says, While they were on their way, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders, they counseled together and gave them a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say the disciples came by night and stole him away while you were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we'll win him over and keep you out of trouble. They took the money and did what they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and still is to this day. And it still is to this day the Jews' denial of that empty tomb. But we read in Luke's account in Luke chapter 24. Go to Luke the 24th chapter. Three days later on that resurrection morning beginning in verse 1, Luke 24. Luke records, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. That's the women. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. When they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling apparel. And as the women were terrified, they bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how He spoke to you while He was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again? And they remembered His words. And they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here, but He is risen. And... In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the birth of the New Testament church, the first sermon that was preached of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ after Jesus had ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, A.D. 33, and we read in Acts chapter 2 as the Holy Spirit led the apostle Peter to teach what to do to be saved from their sins. And we read that Peter says to this Jewish crowd in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 22. Acts chapter 2 verse 22. Notice what Peter said to these Jews. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through Him in your midst just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. Yeah, it's impossible for that tomb. It was impossible. He'd taken soldiers and put them around the tomb and putting a seal over that tomb. Death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. That tomb could not hold him. The Creator of all was raised again on that third day and Jesus conquered death. So that Paul would write in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and notice what Paul writes. Because Jesus... Conquered death because that tomb was empty. 
Paul would write these words in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Starting in verse 9, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says that He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and the grace which He granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now Jesus abolished death. He conquered that enemy. And I want to share another part of the book by Max Lucado, Six Hours, One Friday. Death. The bully on the block of life. He catches you in the alley. He taunts you on the playground. He badgers you on the way home. You too will die someday. You see Him as He escorts the procession of the hearse-led cars. He's in the waiting room as you walk out the double doors in the intensive care unit. He's near you as you stare at the pictures of the bloated bellies of the starving in Zimbabwe. He'll be watching your expression as you slow your car past the crunched metal and the blanketed bodies on the highway. Your time is coming, he jabs. Oh, we try to prove him wrong. We jog, we diet, we pump iron, we play golf. We try to escape it, knowing all along that we will only at best postpone it. Everyone has a number, he reminds. And every number will be called. He'll make your stomach tighten. He'll leave you wide-eyed and flat-footed. He'll fence you in with fear. He'll steal the joy of your youth and the peace of your final years. And if he achieves what he sets out to do, he'll make you so afraid of dying that you never learn to live. That is why you should never face him alone. This bully is too big for you to fight by yourself. That's why we need a big brother. And in our scripture reading, go back to Hebrews chapter 2. And the Hebrew writer tells us about our elder brother, our big brother. As Christians, Jesus is our big brother. He is our elder brother. And I want you to notice that in Hebrews, the second chapter. In verse 9, the Hebrew writer is telling us about how Jesus, our big brother, tasted death for every man. He died paying the penalty for my sins and your sins and the world's sins so that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. He paid our penalty. And by that, that we can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And notice in verse 11, at the end of it, He's not ashamed to call us brothers, brethren. That's Jesus. And He calls you and I brothers in Christ. We're brothers in Him because He's our elder brother. And I want you to notice what the Hebrew writer says, what our elder brother did in verse 14. In verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, that's us. Since the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise, also partook of the same. That's Jesus, our elder brother. That through death, He might render powerless Him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And He might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly He does not give help to angels, but He gives help to the descendant of Abraham. That's us. That's Christians. That's those who've come to be in Christ. That's what Jesus, our elder brother, has done. He abolished death. He conquered death. And by that empty tomb, He conquered death so that Paul would write these words in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. We read from it earlier, verses 21 and 22. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to start 
in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 20, Paul says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Folks, the words first fruits means many will follow. And if you're in Christ and you remain faithful to Christ, you'll be a part of that, of those first fruits. And verse 21, Since by one man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. That's Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each his own order. Christ the firstfruits. And after that, those who are Christ at His coming. Then comes the end. When He delivers up the kingdom of God and the Father, which He has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For He must reign, which He's reigning now in the heaven as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, He must reign until He's put all His enemies under His feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. And in verse 54, Paul says, But when this, the perishable, will have put on the imperishable, and this, the mortal, will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Verse 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because Jesus conquered death, we will be able to be risen from the grave as well. In Revelation chapter 1, John, with these visions that that he received, and seeing that of the resurrected Christ, in Revelation chapter 1, At the end of verse 17, Jesus says, at the end of verse 17, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys that to death and Hades. Death there is the grave, the tomb that holds the body. Hades is the abode of the the departed soul, the spirit that's eternal that God's placed within us. And it leaves the body at death. And Jesus has the keys both to death and to Hades. That of the grave and that of what holds the departed spirit until that resurrection day. And Jesus says, I was dead but now I'm alive forevermore. That's why John sees in Revelation chapter 5 of this of the book of the seven seals and he sees uh, this lion that's from the tribe of Judah, from the root of David, which is Jesus. He sees a lamb because Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And notice in chapter 5 verse 6, I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. Because the Lamb of God was slain on the cross. He was crucified. He died for our sins. But He didn't remain in that tomb. He was raised and now He is standing because He has been resurrected and alive forevermore. And because He abolished death, He conquered death. We see that that last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And so we read in Revelation 20 at the judgment day when Jesus comes again and the resurrection takes place and all men stand before that judgment throne. In verse 11 of chapter 20, here's the great white throne and He sat upon it. There's the judgment day. And notice down in verse 14, verse 14 says, Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. The lake of fire is Gehenna hell. And that's the eternal punishment. And notice that death and Hades were thrown into it. Death, that of the tomb, and Hades, that of the abode of the departed spirit, is thrown into the lake of fire, which is Gehenna hell. And we come to chapter 21. And when God takes us home, notice in verse 4, Revelation 21 verse 4, John says, He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall no longer be any death, 
That's good news, folks. Isn't that good news? There shall no longer be any death. Notice that. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. First things have passed away. Why? Because death will die to death. There will be no more death. There will be no more parting of loved ones. There will be no more pain. There will be no more crying. There will be no more suffering because of Jesus and what He did with that empty tomb. He conquered death so that He might free us that were subject to slavery all of our lives of the fear of dying so that we don't enjoy living. You can only enjoy living when that fear of dying is removed and that's found in the resurrected Christ by coming to our own death, burial, and resurrection in Jesus Christ. You know, Paul says that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. Not angels, powers, or principalities, or death in Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, only ourselves. No principality, no created thing, Paul says, can separate you from the love of Christ. Not even death. I want us to see third this morning because of the empty tomb. Death is not final. Death is not final. Job centuries ago raised this question in Job chapter 14 and verse 14. If a man dies, will he live again? And Jesus answered that question in John chapter 11 in verse 25 and 26 of the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, when He said that I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in Me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in Me shall, shall live and never die. In other words, if you believe in Him and you live in Him, you will die physically, but you'll live again. But you will not die the second death, the lake of fire, perishing, being eternally separated from God. That's why Jesus gives us life and immortality. He gives us eternal life that we will not be separated from God when we put our faith and remain faithful to Him. Everyone who lives and believes in Me shall never die. He didn't say you wouldn't die physically. All men will die physically unless He comes again to take us home to, to that of the eternal home. But none of us have to die spiritually separated from God if you live and believe in Jesus Christ. In this chapter, Lazarus is dying. And at the beginning of chapter 11, the sisters send for Jesus. He's up in Galilee. They send message and say, Lazarus, whom you love, he is sick to the point of death. Jesus remained two more days before he even made his journey down there to Bethany, just right outside of Jerusalem. By the time Jesus and His disciples got there, Lazarus had been dead and in the tomb for four days. Four days. Funeral is, is already passed and the people are still mourning with the sisters. When Martha sees Jesus coming, she runs out to Him and she says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Every one of us can relate to Martha's words. If you have had a loved one pass away, you know the pain. You know the ache. You know the sorrow. You know the shock. You know what death does when it comes, when it hits your home. It is, it is only that tragic of something that when you experience it, you'll understand what those sisters said. Lord, if you'd have been here, you raised the sick, you healed the blind, you, you, you were able to do all kinds of things, walk on water, change bread, and feed multitudes. If you'd just been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus told her one of the greatest truths. I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she believed in the resurrection. And when the other sister Mary came and she said the same thing, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And when he saw those sisters weeping, Jesus was deeply moved in spirit, the Bible tells us. He was troubled. He became angry because He knew the pain that it brought into those loved ones' hearts. Jesus did not weep for Lazarus. He had already told His apostles previously, He said, this is to the glory of God. He's asleep and I must raise Him. And then He plainly told His apostles that Lazarus was dead and He was going to raise him back to life. 
Jesus did not weep there for Lazarus. He was weeping for Martha and Mary and the pain that it brings into hearts of loved ones when our loved ones have been departed from us because of that enemy death and that temporal separation. And by that, Jesus said, where did they lay? And they went to the tomb and He said, roll away the stone. And He cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of that tomb, out of that grave. And He says, unbind him, let him go. Unbind him because now he's been raised back to life. Notice on, your, on the conclusion there of your sermon outline. This is by Bruce McLarty, the president there at Harding University who's written uh, the book titled Journey of Faith, Walking with Jesus through the Gospel of John. Bruce writes, The story of Jesus at Lazarus' tomb helps us to comfort our own fears of death. Because of what Jesus did then and still does today, we do not have to deny the reality of death in order to find joy in this life. As Christians, we do not run from death, we face it. We do not pretend that it will not happen to us. We proclaim to the world that we have an answer to it. Death is a reality of life. We can be thankful that Christianity has the answer to death. The knowledge that Jesus is the resurrection and the life allows us to have peace and joy in the real world. Only by first facing up to our fears of death can we have true joy in this life. When Lazarus walked out of that cave near Bethany, he showed us how our own stories will end. It's true that unless the Lord returns soon, all of us will face death. However, since Jesus is the resurrection and the life, we view death differently. Our bodies will someday be placed in graves, but we know that we will someday rise from those graves. The irony is that when we believe that Jesus is the answer to the problem of death, then and only then are we ready to live. The journey of faith carries us through death and on to the resurrection. For Christians, every Sunday is Easter. Every Lord's Day we celebrate His coming. Herschel shared with us from 1 Corinthians 15, we proclaim His death until He comes. It's not a dead Savior coming, folks. It's a resurrected Savior. And we celebrate Jesus' life, His death, burial, and resurrection every Lord's Day. Every day we celebrate what Jesus has done for us through His death and His burial and His resurrection. And how we come to receive those benefits is by identifying with the story, the gospel story, the story of love, the greatest story there is. That Jesus died for me. He died for you. He took the penalty of our sins and bore it on the cross so that we would never be separated from God. He bore my hell on Calvary. He bore your hell on Calvary. So that no man would have to be separated from God. No man would perish. That all could have hope. Paul says about those who come to be in Christ when they die, he said, we don't weep for them as those who have no hope. Why? Because they've been born again to a blessed hope. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That blessed hope that you and I have been born again is a living hope because we have a living Savior. And when you come to live in that living Savior and live out that story, that gospel story of His good news of the death, burial, and resurrection by identifying with it coming to your own death, burial, of dying to self and to sin and to this world, being buried in the watery graves of baptism, you put Christ on and you're raised up with Him and you identify in union with His resurrection. He raises you up as a new creature in Christ.
Your old sins have been washed away and you're a new creature. And for us in Christ, every day is a new day. Every day is a day of celebration. Every day is a day to say, thank you God for giving me another day here upon this earth with my loved ones and with my family and with the church. Thank you for the blessings that you give me. That's the power of the resurrection. We celebrate it every day. And if you're not in Christ, we want to invite you to come and be in Christ that you can have that power in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus that you can be reconciled to God the Father, the Creator. He loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. That life's found in Jesus. He is the resurrection and the life. And though we die, we'll live again. And those who come to live and believe in Him will never die. Never be separated from Him. But that of a place that there's a day coming of no more death. Death will die to death. That enemy's been conquered through Jesus Christ. No more pain. No more crying. No more dying. Are you in Jesus? We want to invite you to come. If we can help you anyway this morning, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? We invite you to come. Have you a heart that's weary, trending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burdens you bear? Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard He loves you and that He will abide to the end. Who knows your disappointments? Who hears each time you cry? Who understands your heartaches? Who dries the tears from your eyes? Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard He loves you and that He will abide to the end? We come to the portion of our worship where we uh, give back a portion to what God's given to us. So, would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you again for uh, another day that you have created. We, we rejoice and we're glad in it. Father, we thank you for providing for us and meeting all of our needs. And Father, we thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No announcements today, but we'll say happy anniversary to Larry and Christine. Any announcements need to be made today? If not, please let's all be standing while Brother Jim leads us in closing prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Easter morning. We had a snowstorm overnight, and then we awoke to clear skies, and we just want to thank you for that. This is symbolic of, of the uh, storms in our life that, that your love and your light shines through. Thank you for the King of Kings, what he did for us so that we may have everlasting life.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.